This video is on synapses, neurotransmitters, and EPSPs and IPSPs. So I just want to go back and do a very, very short review on the transmembrane potentials that we've learned so far. We learned about the resting membrane potential that is negative 70 millivolts in the neuron, and that's caused by those negatively charged proteins, as well as the leak channels, and there's more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels, and the concentration gradients of both sodium and potassium. In addition to those leak channels, we also learned that the cell body and the dendrites have these chemically gated channels, and these chemically regulated channels were sensitive to certain chemicals. We talked about a chemical called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to sodium chemically regulated channels, opening those channels so that sodium ions would rush into the cell. As sodium ions rush in through these gated channels, the positive charges in the cell cause the resting membrane potential to move from negative 70 to negative 69 and even more positive. As more sodium diffuses into the cell through those gated channels, the positive charges are funneled down towards the axon hillock. The axon hillock acts as a funnel and it gathers those positive charges and the transmembrane potential may get as high as a negative 61 without creating an action potential. The charge from negative 69 millivolts to negative 61 millivolts is called a graded potential. However, if enough sodium enters into the cell and enough positive charges funnel into that axon hillock and down to the initial segment of the axon, and the charge reaches a negative 60 millivolts, which is threshold, that opens up another gated channel that's found on the axon. These are voltage gated channels and at negative 60 millivolts this triggers the voltage gated sodium channels to open. There are a lot of sodium channels on the axon and when those voltage gated sodium channels open up sodium floods into the cell. The axon at that initial segment quickly depolarizes, meaning it gets more positive, so it moves from negative 60 millivolts all the way up to positive 30 millivolts. At positive 30 millivolts, this is another voltage that the uh, sodium-gated channels are sensitive to. At positive 30, the voltage-regulated sodium channels close, and the voltage-regulated potassium channels open. Potassium leaves the cell, leaves the axon through these voltage-regulated potassium channels, and the transmembrane potential becomes more negative again. As the transmembrane potential rapidly becomes negative, we call this repolarization, and the positive 30 millivolts quickly decreases to negative 70 millivolts. Midway between positive 30 and negative 70 millivolts, which is a 100 millivolt change, there will be a point in the middle where the sodium channels become, become capable of opening again, even though they're still closed. This is the beginning of relative refractory period, where another charge could cause another action potential, but probably would take a bigger stimulus. At negative 70 millivolts, the voltage-gated potassium channels begin to close. Since they don't close at the same time, this means that potassium continues to leak out of the cell and the charge continues to drop to a negative 90 millivolts. As the charge drops from resting membrane potential of negative 70 to negative 90, we call this hyperpolarization because the charge is getting further away from threshold. At negative 90 millivolts, all the potassium channels are closed and the sodium-potassium exchange pump, the leak channels, and the concentration gradients of sodium and potassium bring that negative 90 millivolt charge back up to resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts.
we learned that as the voltage-gated sodium channels opened on that initial segment of the axon, and the sodium ions moved into that initial segment, those positive charges were carried to the adjacent segment of the axon where they uh, helped that adjacent segment reach threshold and that adjacent segment then generated an action potential. And at that adjacent segment, as sodium ions diffused into the cell, the positive charges moved down more distally to the next adjacent segment of the axon, creating another action potential. And this continued until the action potential traveled all the way down to the synaptic terminal. At the synaptic terminal, there will be a synapse as a neurotransmitter is released from the synaptic terminal onto that postsynaptic cell. Now this is where we begin our lecture today, at that synapse between the synaptic terminal of the neuron and the postsynaptic cell. Here are the four steps of a synapse. And we'll look at each of these steps separately. In this first picture, we can see the presynaptic cell and the synaptic terminal or the axon terminal of this uh, neuron. And so we see action potentials arriving at the synaptic terminal. All of these action potentials together are called a nerve impulse. The presynaptic neuron is going to be the neuron that transmits the message to another neuron. And the postsynaptic neuron here, or the postsynaptic cell, is the neuron that receives the message from the presynaptic neuron. A synapse can involve other types of postsynaptic cells, such as what we saw with the neuromuscular junction. The synapse that we see here is a chemical synapse, and it's the most abundant type of synapse. There's another type of synapse that's called an electrical synapse. They're located in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but they're extremely rare. In an electrical synapse, the presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes meet at gap junctions, so the cells are held very tightly together and the changes in the transmembrane potential of one cell produce local currents that affect the other cell as if they shared a common membrane. An action potential that reached the electrical synapse would always be propagated to the next cell. So that's different than this uh, that I'm showing you here. This is a chemical synapse, which again is the most abundant type of synapse. And it's more dynamic than a, an electrical synapse because the cells are not directly coupled. They're not held together by gap junctions. Instead, the action potentials arrive at the synaptic terminal and they may or may not be propagated to the postsynaptic cell. This depends on how many neurotransmitters are released, whether there's enough neurotransmitter being released. Most synapses between neurons and between neurons and other cells are chemical synapses. An excitatory neurotransmitter will cause depolarization to occur on the postsynaptic cell, meaning it will cause the postsynaptic cell to become more positive and promote an action potential to be generated. An inhibitory neurotransmitter, on the other hand, will cause hyperpolarization and will cause the transmembrane potential of the postsynaptic cell to become more negative. This will suppress the action potential from being generated because it's taking it further away from threshold. The effect of a neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic membrane depends on the properties of the receptor and not the neurotransmitter. What we're seeing here is a cholinergic synapse. A cholinergic synapse is a synapse where the presynaptic cell releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We've seen this before at the neuromuscular junction. At the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is released and binds to the sodium channels of the skeletal muscles. We also see cholinergic synapses in the central nervous system, 
in all the neuron-to-neuron synapses in the peripheral nervous system and at all neuromuscular junctions and neuroglandular junctions of the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Let's take a look at the events that occur at a cholinergic synapse. In step one, an action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal. As I said before, these action potentials, as they travel down the axon of the neuron, are called collectively a nerve impulse. The action potential depolarizes the synaptic terminal. Let's take a look at what we see in this picture. In the synaptic terminal or axon terminal, we see these vesicles. Each vesicle is filled with the molecule acetylcholine or ACH. Each of these vesicles can hold up to 3,000 acetylcholine molecules. Then we see a, a space, which is called the synaptic cleft, that is in between the synaptic terminal of the presynaptic neuron and the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. On the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron, we see gated channels. These are chemically regulated sodium channels. And on these proteins, these gated channels, there is a receptor for acetylcholine, which is called the acetylcholine receptor. So an action potential has traveled to the synaptic terminal and has depolarized it. So now let's look at step two. In step two, the action potential depolarizing the synaptic terminal causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So as the synaptic terminal is depolarized, the voltage change causes these calcium channels, which are sensitive to the voltage, to open. Calcium is higher in the extracellular fluid, so calcium moves into the synaptic terminal. The entry of the extracellular calcium ions into the synaptic terminal trigger the exocytosis of acetylcholine that's in those vesicles into the synaptic cleft. Now the acetylcholine molecules are in the synaptic cleft. Let's see what happens next. In step three, we see that acetylcholine molecules travel across the synaptic cleft and bind to the ACH receptor on the chemically regulated sodium channels on the postsynaptic cell. The binding of acetylcholine causes the sodium channels to open up and the extracellular sodium travels or diffuses into that postsynaptic cell, causing the postsynaptic cell to depolarize. Next, we see step four. In step four, we see an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that's found in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholinesterase removes acetylcholine from the acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic cell and breaks it down. As it breaks it down into choline and acetate, the choline is reuptaked back into the synaptic terminal where it can be used to produce more acetylcholine. Now typically, acetylcholine is produced in two places. First of all, the cell body produces acetylcholine and the acetylcholine travels down to the synaptic terminal where it's stored in vesicles. But acetylcholine is also produced as the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft is broken down and choline is brought back into the synaptic terminal and then recycled. The acetylcholine that is recycled goes back into the vesicles where it will wait for more calcium to diffuse in before it's released again from the synaptic terminal. A synaptic delay occurs between the arrival of the action potential at the synaptic terminal and the effect of acetylcholine on the postsynaptic membrane. It takes time for calcium to diffuse into the synaptic terminal, 
It takes time for acetylcholine to be released through exocytosis, and it takes time for the acetylcholine to travel across the synaptic cleft. All of these things cause the synaptic delay, although the calcium entering into the synaptic terminal and causing the exocytosis is the primary reason for the synaptic delay. If there's only one synapse, meaning only two neurons are involved, the shorter the delay will be. So the fewer the synapses involved, the shorter the total delay. If there are several neurons involved in a row and there are several synapses, the longer the total delay will be. Reflexes, which provide very rapid and automatic responses, involve very few synapses. Synaptic fatigue can also occur under intensive stimulation when the synthesis and transport of acetylcholine by the cell body and the resynthesis or recycling of acetylcholine in the synaptic terminal is unable to keep pace with the demand for acetylcholine. Other than acetylcholine, there are other neurotransmitters. There are biogenic amines, which include norepinephrine and dopamine. Norepinephrine is widely distributed in the brain and in portions of the autonomic nervous system. The synapses where norepinephrine is released are called adrenergic synapses. Norepinephrine is typically always excitatory, and it depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane, bringing it closer to threshold. Dopamine is another biogenic amine that's released in many areas of the brain. Dopamine may have inhibitory or excitatory effects, meaning it may bring the cell membrane closer to threshold or it might take it further away from threshold. Dopamine in the brain has an inhibitory effect on acetylcholine. And this inhibitory effect of acetylcholine helps to make muscle movements much smoother. If there's an inadequate production of dopamine in one portion of the brain, it can lead to an overstimulation of neurons that controls skeletal muscle tone due to the lack of inhibitory control due to the lack of dopamine. This is what we see in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is characterized by an inadequate production of dopamine. Since dopamine production is not high enough, acetylcholine isn't tempered, and skeletal muscle tone will increase, causing tremors. Dopamine's excitatory effects are that it causes a high in the brain. Cocaine inhibits the removal of dopamine from synapses so that dopamine is present longer in areas of the brain, creating a high. Another biogenic amine is serotonin. Serotonin affects attention and emotional states and causes a person to have a sense of well-being. Inadequate serotonin production affects this attention and emotional states and can cause depression. An antidepressant such as SSRI that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor is an antidepressant that works by increasing levels of serotonin within the brain. This antidepressant inhibits the reabsorption of serotonin by the synaptic terminal. Other than biogenic amines, there is a classification of neurotransmitters called amino acids. GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. GABA is inhibitory of the brain. It reduces anxiety. Some anti-anxiety drugs enhance GABA, like Valium. 20% of all synapses in the brain release GABA. There's another type of amino acid neurotransmitter, and that's called glycine. 
Glycine is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter of the spinal cord and the brainstem. A third class of neurotransmitters are called neuromodulators. Neuromodulators are neuropeptide neurotransmitters. Neuropeptides are small peptide chains that are synthesized and released by the synaptic terminal. Neuromodulators can alter the rate of neurotransmitter being released by the presynaptic cell, and they can change the response of the postsynaptic cell. An example of a neuromodulator are opioids. Opioids have similar effects of opium and morphine. There are three classes of opioids in the central nervous system, endorphins, enkephalins, and dynorphins. All three classes of opioids cause pain relief by inhibiting the postsynaptic cell's response to the neurotransmitter. An action potential arriving at the synaptic terminal triggers a chemical event that affects the postsynaptic cell. The postsynaptic cell might become stimulated or it might become inhibited. The postsynaptic cell might be receiving excitatory stimuli as well as inhibitory stimuli at the same time. Both the excitatory and the inhibitory stimuli have to be integrated in the postsynaptic cell. We call these stimuli, both excitatory and inhibitory stimuli, postsynaptic potentials. Postsynaptic potentials are graded potentials that develop in the postsynaptic membrane in response to a neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic potential can be either excitatory or inhibitory. And an excitatory postsynaptic potential is called an EPSP. This is when the neurotransmitter that arrives at the postsynaptic membrane causes depolarization. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential is called an IPSP. This is when a neurotransmitter hyperpolarizes the postsynaptic membrane. So an EPSP or excitatory postsynaptic potential causes the opening of sodium channels and sodium rushes into the postsynaptic cell causing depolarization and causing the transmembrane potential to become more positive. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential or IPSP is when the chemically regulated potassium channels open and potassium leaves the cell causing the transmembrane potential of the cell to become more negative. This is inhibitory, making that transmembrane potential further from threshold. The EPSPs and the IPSPs are integrated together through summation and this will ultimately result in the cell being either depolarized or hyperpolarized. An individual EPSP or an IPSP doesn't have much of an effect on the transmembrane potential. It takes multiple EPSPs or IPSPs to create an effect in the postsynaptic cell. The summation of an EPSP can either be through temporal summation or spatial summation. Temporal summation is the addition of stimuli occurring in rapid succession. It occurs at a single synapse that is active repeatedly. Sodium ions enter the cytoplasm during an EPSP, and every time an action potential arrives, a group of vesicles discharge acetylcholine. If a second EPSP arrives before the effects of the first have disappeared, more acetylcholine is released. In this way, a series of small steps can lead to threshold. In this picture, we can see through temporal summation one presynaptic neuron and one postsynaptic neuron, 
And similar to one drumstick on a snare drum, it just depends on how fast that one presynaptic cell is releasing acetylcholine or how fast that drumstick is beating on that drum that will determine the activity of that postsynaptic cell or the sound that's produced in that snare drum. With spatial summation, this occurs when simultaneous stimuli are at different locations and they have a cumulative effect on the transmembrane potential. It involves multiple synapses that are active simultaneously. So in other words, there are multiple presynaptic cells causing an effect on one postsynaptic cell. The activity of one synapse produces a graded potential with localized effects. And this is summated by a different synapse at a different location on the postsynaptic cell producing a graded potential with more localized effects. At each active synapse, the sodium ions that produce the EPSP spread out along the inner surface of the membrane and mingle with those entering at other sites. An action potential appears when the transmembrane potential reaches threshold. In this picture, I've illustrated spatial summation showing two presynaptic neurons on one postsynaptic neuron. And I've um, compared it to a drum with two drumsticks. So the effects of two drumsticks on the snare drum will cause activity of the drum, similar to the two presynaptic neurons creating a summation effects in the postsynaptic neuron. Spatial or temporal summation of EPSPs may not depolarize the initial segment to threshold on the postsynaptic cell, but it does make it easier for the next stimulus to trigger an action potential. A neuron that is brought closer to threshold is said to be facilitated. So any neuron that is brought closer from negative 70 towards negative 60, which is threshold, is said to be facilitated. The larger the degree of facilitation, the smaller the additional stimulus is needed to reach threshold. Nicotine is a chemical that stimulates the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors producing prolonged EPSPs. So those neurons are facilitated and closer to threshold. Caffeine, on the other hand, lowers the threshold at the initial segment, making a stronger stimulus necessary in order to reach threshold. Here in this picture, we see how EPSPs depolarize the postsynaptic membrane, bringing it closer to threshold, and IPSPs hyperpolarize, taking the cell further from threshold. If the EPSP and the IPSPs are equal, then they cancel each other out and the cell remains at the resting membrane potential. Both EPSPs and IPSPs summate either spatially or temporally. Things like neuromodulators or hormones or both can change the postsynaptic membrane's sensitivity to both excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. Here are some pictures of EPSBs and IPSBs that I wanted to share with you. So in the first picture, we see an action potential traveling down to the synaptic terminal, opening the calcium gates, causing the release of ACH into the synaptic cleft. ACH binds to the postsynaptic cell on the acetylcholine receptor of the chemically regulated sodium channel. The channel opens up and sodium moves into the cell, into the postsynaptic cell, depolarizing it. So the postsynaptic cell becomes depolarized, and this is called an EPSP. It gets more positive and closer to threshold. So this is what we call an EPSP. In the second picture, we see the action potential travel to the synaptic terminal, causing the opening of the calcium gates, calcium coming into the synaptic terminal, causing the exocytosis of another neurotransmitter, 
that's called GABA. GABA binds to the neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell, which is a chemically gated chloride channel. So the gate opens up and chloride comes into the cell based on the laws of diffusion and the cell hyperpolarizes. Chloride has a negative charge. So as chloride comes into the postsynaptic cell, it causes the resting membrane potential of negative 70 to become more negative. So closer to negative 80, negative 90. It brings that uh, resting membrane potential further from threshold. In the third example here, we see an IPSP that's caused by dr a drug. So in this case, we're seeing that the postsynaptic cell is being inhibited because of a drug. This drug here that we see is one that activates the potassium ion channels. So the drug binds to the chemically regulated potassium gated channel and the channel opens up and potassium, based on the laws of diffusion, leaves the cell making the cell more negative. So the positive charges leave the cell, the cell gets more negative or hyperpolarizes, taking it further from threshold. So far we've been talking about the effects of the receptors on the postsynaptic cell, but now I wanna talk about some of the effects that can occur on the presynaptic cell. The presynaptic cell can be inhibited or it can be facilitated just like the postsynaptic cell can. Presynaptic inhibition and facilitation can modify the rate of neurotransmitter being released at the synaptic terminal. During presynaptic inhibition, the release of GABA inhibits the opening of the calcium channels in the synaptic knob. So if the calcium channels can't open up, that means that um, less calcium is coming in, and that means that less neurotransmitter will be um, moved out of the synaptic terminal into the synaptic cleft. If there's less neurotransmitter being released, that means fewer ion channels on the postsynaptic cell will be activated, and uh, there will have less of an effect then on the postsynaptic neuron. On the other hand, with presynaptic facilitation, this means that more neurotransmitter will be released at a faster rate. So in this example, we see serotonin. Serotonin activates the calcium channels. So more calcium channels are opened up, more calcium diffuses into the synaptic terminal, causing more neurotransmitter to be released into the synaptic cleft, opening up the ion channels on the postsynaptic cell, and then the postsynaptic cell becomes facilitated and depolarizes closer to threshold. In the nervous system, all sensory and motor commands must be translated into action potentials that can be propagated along axons. The frequency of the action potentials determines the interpretation of the message. The frequency of the action potentials depends on the degree of depolarization above threshold. The greater the degree of depolarization, the higher the frequency of action potentials. The maximum frequency is established by the duration of the absolute refractory period. The absolutely refractory period is shortest in large diameter axons. What this means is that the shorter the absolute refractory period, the faster another action potential can occur at that segment of the axon. So the large diameter axons, which have a shorter refractory period, will be able to carry action potentials at a faster rate than smaller diameter axons, which is something that we've already learned. All right, this ends our video for today.